All right, what about this dining room table? Who eats here? I had this table made because I found these legs in an antique store, four beautiful carved legs. And I said to the people in the antique store, what are those from? And they said they're from a square piano. And the piano's long since disintegrated, but we have the legs. And so I bought them and I took them to a table maker and I said, could you make me a dining room table with those legs? And they're beautiful. We've had more fun dinners around this table. Beautiful. I thought the whole table was original antique, but you created it. Yeah. Okay, who's coming to dinner tonight? You and Kathy and the kids. Okay, that sounds good. And the crew and everybody watching the show, you're invited if you want to come over. I love <laughs> having people over. Come on over. Come on in. Doors always open. How did Gloria Stivic come to you? Well. Do you remember the, the sequence of events that changed your life? Yes. Unbeknownst to me, while I was doing whatever I was doing, which was a movie with Jack Nicholson, Five Easy Pieces and doing the Smothers Brothers show and the Tim Conway Comedy Hour. All in the Family had been made as a pilot two years in a row for ABC. Each time they'd used Carol O'Connor as Archie and Gene Stapleton as Edith. First time they made it, they had a Mike and a Gloria. They shot it, ABC looked at it. After they made it, they said, this is too controversial, we can't put this on the air. They shelved it. The next year they brought it out again. They made another pilot with Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton, but they said, we need a new set of kids. So they got a second Mike and a second Gloria. Looked at it again, shelved it again. Then Robert Woods, who was president of CBS, got wind of it and said to Norman Lear, if you bring it over here, I will put it on the air. We won't make a pilot. The first episode we make will be the first episode on the air. But I think it needs a new Mike and a new Gloria. So Rob Reiner and I were the third set of kids. So third talk time. about lucky. and. Here's, you know, the universe being one with you. I was on the Tim Conway Comedy Hour, and I was <laughs> the Tim Conway dancer. If you remember Jackie Gleason, he had the June Taylor dancers, and there were 40 beautiful women, tall, leggy, gorgeous, and they would get on the floor and do patterns with an overhead camera. They'd be seeing enemy. They'd be so. Uh, Tim Conway's show was supposed to look cheap, as if he didn't have a budget. So they started the show with one musician who didn't even have an instrument. Art Matrano just had to hum the music. And they'd say, and now the Tim Conway dancer, and they'd sweep over to me, and I would be doing this ridiculous tap dance, dressed like a pagoda or something. And then I would lie on the floor, and I would do patterns with my arms and legs, which when, when you're just one person, it looks really stupid. And it was hilarious. And you know what those suits said in New York? She makes the show look cheap. And the producer, Sam Bobrick and Ron Clark, said, that's the point. That's why the first show on the air was a Christmas show, because we said we were worried we were going to cancel before we got to Christmas. So in September, we put a Christmas show on. That's the whole idea. They said, no, you got to let her go. Oh, my goodness. If I hadn't been let go, I wouldn't have been free to read for all in the family. There you go. <laughs> go figure. Go figure. Talk about raising your daughter. Yes. You were a single mom. Yes. What was the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge for me was that my ex-husband is not a friend of mine. That's a challenge. And because he's not a friend, um, there was a lot of bitterness, which I tried to not pass on to my daughter. I don't think my single motherhood was as difficult for me and for Samantha as my career was for Samantha. My career took me away from her sometimes and she is just now at 24 years old learning to forgive me for that really yes. I had no idea oh a lot of anger there but how would it be different for any single parent who has to work to make a living I mean you were in a very rarefied world of show business but if you were working at Macy's and were gone on the you know at Christmas time to do the wrapping till midnight how would that be different I think having a job in town, whether it's six or 12 hours a day, is more acceptable than a parent, the only parent in the house, going completely away to another state, to another coast. And I really didn't do, I, the first time I did that to her, she was five. And I could not get arrested in Hollywood. I was not getting work. And Tommy Toon offered me the role of Miss Mamie Lynch, the high school teacher, the English teacher at Rydell High in the musical Grease, and I had to leave. 
and Samantha saw trunks come out and suitcases and a mountain of clothes on my bed that I was going to pack because we were going to tour and I was going to be year-round in all kinds of weather. I needed things for cold weather and hot weather. She and thought you were leaving boots. for good. Well, it looked like that. Oh. It was pretty upsetting. And she said, why, why do you have all the stuff? I said, I told you, Mommy got a job. I have to go away. She said, well, do you have to take everything? Oh. And I said, well, I'm going to be in a lot of different weather. And she said, well, did you try to get a job here? And I said, I did, Samantha. I really did. I've exhausted all the avenues I can think of. And she said, did you call everyone? Wow. And I said, yes, honey, I did. And your grandma and your great aunt are coming down from Oregon to take care of you. Well, the next day, a van shows up for the luggage, and a sedan shows up for me. And she's on the porch. She's waving goodbye. I'm waving goodbye. I have never left her before. I am trying not to cry. And we always had played this game of who loves the other one the most. I love you. Well, I love you more. Well, I love you more than all the trees on our property. Well, I love you more than all the leaves on all those trees. One upmanship. She yells from the porch, I love you, Mom. And I said, I love you too, Samantha. And I love you more because I'm bigger. And she said, and this made me cry all the way to the airport, No, Mom. I love you more because I've loved you all my life and you've only loved me part of yours. Oh my God. How do you think that made me feel going away? I think I would have thought I've got a really smart kid. I did have a really smart kid, which was in itself a challenge raising her. So today, Yes. what does she say about all those times? You say that she has forgiven, that she's moved on. She's moving on. She's is it because she realizes she's an adult and she realizes what you adult. went through? And it's Sam's an adult now. She is working. She's going to graduate school. She bought herself her own car. She's making her car payment. She's paying her rent. She keeps saying to me with wonderment every few times we see each other or speak on the phone, I'm an adult now. How did this happen? And because she is and feels the pressure of all of that, she's now begun to realize that I really did the best job I could. And I didn't do such a bad job. You did better than the best job. You really did. She's an amazing kid. She Graduate of... Vassar. Vassar College. And now getting her PhD in clinical psychology. And you put her through Vassar. I did, those which is Tommy, why I don't live in that big house in Brentwood anymore. Those Tommy Toon shows and everything else put this child through Vassar. Does she appreciate it? Yes, she does. she does. realize yes, how hard it is for anyone to put their kid through a top-notch school, how expensive and how demanding? I did one. You've done three. I don't know how you're doing it. And you look good. <laughs> don't ask. Your wife is growing gray and old in the closet. No, no, no. Good, she right? looks better than me. But uh, MasterCard, Visa, and American Express, oh, boy, are very well, very Express, well used. American Express called me this morning and they said, please leave home without it. <laughs> I want to know what that Van Gogh painting is all about there. Oh, well, um, I love Vincent Van Gogh. I have ever since I was a child who was privileged enough to be given art lessons at the Portland Museum of Art. And there was a Van Gogh exhibit there when I was in grade school. And... Uh, Many years later, now into adulthood, I went to a friend's house and they had a magnificent painting in their living room of these beautiful trees. And I said, who did that? And the husband said, my son, Robert, paints. And so I said, I'd like to see his paintings. And he had done that of sunflowers. And I love how irreverent it is because there's beer bottles and, and a, an ashtray with a, a cigarette. And a police car. And a police car and little army men. <laughs> and I just think that's so funny. To put with the beautiful vase and flowers. It is funny. Go back to Samantha. What do you want for your daughter? What, what would be, what would make you the happiest for her, at this point? I think everybody for their children wants them to just be happy and have a healthy life. And I don't think it's possible to be happy without your health. So first of all, I wish for her continued good health. I pray for that all the time. Then on top of it, because she comes from such a wacky mother and such a strange father. I wish for her peace of mind. And I think Oof. if she has that health and she has that peace of mind, she will be a happy person. I think she stands a better chance than most. But she is now in her mid-twenties finding a nice level 
I mean, she goes to therapy. I know she wishes I would go to therapy. I do went you to think therapy you need, a few times. Do you think you need to? Oh, I definitely need therapy. I think if I'd been to therapy right after I was divorced, I probably would have been remarried by now, maybe for a long time and maybe successfully. Would you like to be remarried? Well, I'm so long in the tooth now, and I'm so used to having my own way, I'm not sure I could acquiesce to a partner. I don't know. I think you'd be a great partner. I think yeah. you'd be a wonderful partner. You know, a lot of people say, I've been alone for a long time, I'm so set in my ways, I'm not going to move my clothes out of the closet, all those kinds of excuses, but I don't know. You have so much, you have so much heart and so much soul. Why wouldn't you want it? Well, life is a big old banana cream pie. Now, what's wrong with you if you want the whole pie? You're hungry? You're hungry. You're and a if pig? You, and you're a pig if you eat it all. <laughs> but you can have almost everything of the pie and still be okay. Now look what I've got. I've got health. I've got family. Fabulous. I've got beautiful, numerous friends. More than I can count on two hands and my two feet. Dedicated, loyal fans, starting with Pamela. I've got a career that's taken me all over the world. I've met kings and presidents and dined at the White House. And more importantly, I've seen you meet regular old folks after a show and treat them like they were the one and only. Well, everybody. Now that some people would call that pandering only. to you, but I have seen that over and over again. You treat people with such respect. Well, that's how I would like to be treated. Are you? Not always. What about rudeness in life? Does it seem to you that we're all so stressed out that people are enormously rude in everyday situations? Well, if you don't gun your gas pedal the millisecond that the Honk. light turns green, someone's honking you. Well, that's because you're drinking coffee, talking on the cell phone, having your makeup done, and writing a letter. Yeah, exactly. Talk to me a little bit about the Gilmore Girls. I well, love that show, and you are wonderful on it. Why aren't you on it more? I have so much fun. That part that I play on there, the next door neighbor, Babette, uh, is my homage to Ruth Gordon. So when you're Babette, are you thinking Ruth Gordon? I am thinking Ruth Gordon all the way, and luckily I am such a bad impersonator that nobody knows I am attempting to do Ruth Gordon. It just looks like I found this wonderful character. Well, I have to tell you, because I know you, when I've seen it, I think because you do a character called the Reverend Highly Unlikely. <laughs> I think, is that the Reverend coming out, or is that, what is Babette? Now I know it's Ruth Gordon. Will you do a moment of the Reverend for us on camera? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend. Do you want to be loved? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, did your, did your lover do a wheelie on your outstretched arms and leave you picking gravel out of your teeth? <laughs> she did. Then come to the Reverend Paramore. <laughs> I'm going to give you many emotion potion strips to hang behind your ears that are guaranteed to get you kisses, compliments, and commitments. Now, what do I mean by commitment? <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean by commitment? It just goes on and on. I haven't done this in years. You're oh, bad. It's this my is a favorite. direct steal. This from, is my favorite. This is a steal from my friend Tony Greco. Well, it's a great steal. I don't think your Gilmore girl or your All in the Family fans know that it wasn't Priscilla, but it was Miss Sally who was the love of Elvis's life, at least for a moment. Yes, Elvis had many loves. Yeah, well. He loved women. Not as good as you. He loved women who looked like little girls. And you sure did. And I did. And I had quite a lovely, I shall say it, affair with him. How old were you? I was 21 years old, and I probably looked all of 16. How did you meet Elvis? I was living with this woman named Evelyn Churn and her daughter Leslie. They let me bunk in with them. And um, <coughs> Leslie had a friend who knew Elvis. And one time she said, we're all going down to Palm Springs to visit Elvis. Come on. So we all went, and he took a liking to me. And that night, after everyone else went to bed, he must have sung easily 20 times Blue Spanish Eyes to me over and over again. And I was just swooning. Elvis <laughs> Presley was singing me alone in his living room. 20 times? Oh, yeah, you guys. I said, do it again. He'd sing it. He'd put the music back on. Do it again. 
I called him <laughs> E, and he called me Sally. So yeah. how long did this last? A few months. Really? Yeah, he flew me everywhere. How did it end? Or why did I it end? I introduced him to a girlfriend, and he took a liking to her. And there you have it. And that was it. And that was okay with me. Wow. I had had my time with the king. I don't know. It's just a happy house. Right outside this fence out there, see all the bougainvillea growing on the fence? Is where um, Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant? Is where Hugh Grant got picked up by the police. Right outside my fence. How exciting. <laughs> Hi, Hugh. <laughs> Hugh, I'm sure you wanted everyone to be reminded of that. I've told this to you before, I've written this before in articles that I've written, but it is probably one of the most seminal moments in my entire life. And it was just a moment. It wasn't a big deal, it was just a moment. But the year would have been about 1986 or 87, and my mother was in the last stages of Alzheimer's. She was, at that point, only in her late 60s, and she'd only had it for a few years, but it came on really quickly and she deteriorated very quickly. As it does when someone gets struck with it that young. We're sitting in my house, it's a Sunday night, and I think it's either your birthday or the week of your birthday. And your you, darling wife Kathy invited me over and you for I was having your a, chicken dinner. For my chicken, because she knows <laughs> how much I love chicken, and to sit with your family and have dinner. Right. Sunday night. My mother was visiting from San Francisco, and she showed up at the table and came to the table in her bra and her slip. She had she not gotten know. dressed. Well, she thought she was dressed. Right. She didn't yeah. know that she hadn't gotten dressed. Yeah. And she sat down next to you, yes. and you treated her as if she was dressed in the nicest dress or suit or pants or whatever that she ever had in her whole life, never made mention of the fact that she was sitting at dinner in her bra, and she had the best time of her life sitting there talking to you and having chicken dinner. I'll never forget it. Your mother was lovely, and you were lovely to her. And I enjoyed that evening. It meant a lot to me. And it prepared my way for my mother. But you were very close to your mother. Yeah. Talk about how everything just went upside down and changed. We watched this brilliant woman over a nine, ten year period completely disintegrate a piece, a moment, a thought at, at a time. A couple of my sweetest memories in that nightmare were I was sitting in my mother's living room. I grew up in a tiny cracker box of a house. Pamela's been there. The house is this big. So my mother was in the bathroom, and I could hear this conspiratorial whispering and talking. And you know, just as pretending your mother was fully dressed in an evening gown at your chicken dinner, <laughs> I don't have a problem approaching someone who has my mother's condition and just playing along with it. So when she came out of the bathroom, I said, Mom, who are you talking to in there? And she said, oh, I have a friend. And I said, you have a friend in the bathroom? She said, mm-hmm. I said, I would love to meet her. My mother said, you would? I said, yeah. She said, come on. She takes me in the bathroom. Over the sink is the mirror on the medicine chest. She looks at herself in the mirror, and she says to me, you see her? She was pointing at herself. And I said, oh, yes, I do. And she said, I see her in here every day, and we have the best talks. And I said, that is great. And then she did the cutest thing of all. She pointed at herself. She said to me, isn't she cute? Referring to herself. I said, yeah, she is. She's pretty darn adorable. And the other thing that put me over the edge was we got to take care of her at home until the last four months. The last four months got so bad we had to find a place for her. And we found a wonderful place, St. Aidan's in Portland, Oregon. Those people are saints, and it was a new state-of-the-art facility just for people with Alzheimer's. And we were in the, the, the dining room, and a man had come to play the accordion for everyone there. So I was belting out the songs, and my mother leaned over at the end of one song, and she touched my knee and patted it, and she said, You have a very nice voice. And I said, Thank you. And then she said, I 
I bet your mother loves it when you sing for her. I said, yes. Yes, she does. That had to be the hardest moment. And wouldn't you know, when my mother passed away in my arms at 6 o'clock on the morning on the eve of Christmas Eve, she was singing. The last two hours of her life, she did not stop humming. <laughs> She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that cute? And she is. At Mother Struthers, she was uh, an amazing woman. And her daughter got a lot of that amazing spiritual love from that mother. Is love the most important thing in the universe? Love is the only thing in the universe. How do we make people realize that? I, I know that everyone on their deathbed realizes that love is the only thing, and that maybe they should have given more of it or they wish they'd received more of it. But the trick is to get them to realize that about love uh, long before they're at their deathbed. And there's all these do-gooders in the world like me. Pamela calls me Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. And I'm out there determined that if I can start the ripple effect, and if I'm kind to everyone I see today, then maybe they'll in turn be kind to someone else. And I truly believe that that works. You also put that to action in a very concerted effort to save the children for years. You trekked around the world. You donated your time, your money, your energy. And you know what makes me really upset? I know what you're going to say. There are people that have made fun of it. There are people that made fun of your charitable effort. What do you say to them right now on camera, to people that are so mean-spirited that would make jokes about it? I think it's so horrible and so low. And I think it's part of what's wrong with the the world we live in, that somebody would make fun of it. Now, not everybody, but some. And some I have been made fun of, I have been cruelly made fun of by cartoonists, by talk show hosts, um, by comics, stand-up comics. I have been the fodder of some pretty cruel stuff. And at times when I wasn't in a good place in my own life for other reasons, that hurt me to the core so badly I didn't want to leave my house. But the place that I'm at today is that I'm happy I was part of the solution rather than part of the problem. I'm happy my daughter had that example set for her. I'm happy that there are adults all over the world right now that were children 25, 30 years ago who had a chance to grow up and be educated and, and have food for the soul and food for the mind and food for their tummies and now they're productive members of the societies they live in. Do I regret any of it? No. Do I wish that everyone in the world were a little kinder? I do. And they'll realize on their deathbed that maybe they weren't so kind. And I don't want people to realize that on their deathbed. Because when you hand kindness out, most of the time you get it back.